Hello everyone, I'm Professor Geek. Welcome back to the channel. I wanted to discuss this topic on its own video. These are some topics that I've delved into a bit on my office hours live stream and you'll hear me, if you're a regular viewer, you'll hear me re reiterate some of those things I've said, but I, it's rare that I'm able to think through the whole topic and get the whole thing out in one kind of given discussion with with guests who uh, I've invited my guests on to, to give their thoughts and they're going to, to speak and I want them to. So I wanted to do this as a video. Also, I, I sense, I can't be sure, <laughs> but I sense that perhaps my my wonderful um, Office Hours co-host, who I'm immensely grateful that they're with me each week, I'm sensing they kind of want to maybe take me to task on this a little bit or some aspects of it or, or at least open it up for discussion. And this isn't really a topic that I want to open up for discussion on my channel because it is very fundamental to my channel's existence. It has to do with what these mythologies do to our culture. So specifically, again, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start with Star Wars, but this is really uh, has to do with all it has to do with DC. It has to do with a lot of different franchises and mythologies that are revel relevant right now in terms of, of them being manipulated and changed and made increasingly irrelevant by the companies that own them. So let's start with Star Wars and we'll, and we'll see where we go. Culture Wars is what I'm naming this video. Disney, it looks like Disney is just going to own Star Wars. What I mean by that, I don't mean literally is in terms of the rights, because obviously Disney owned the rights to Star Wars as soon as they bought it from Lucasfilm. I mean, Disney it appears that Disney's just going to culturally own Star Wars. They're going to be able to define what Star Wars is for culture. And that wasn't always a set done deal because people were standing up against the nonsense they were pulling. People were standing up for the heroes in Star Wars that they'd love. They were standing up for what that mythology had done for them, had, had done for our culture, the, the heroism and the, the actions and behaviors that the, their characters and their arcs inspired us to. It was, it was an important thing to people, and people were standing up against it. They're doing something. They, 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 so they tried to just ignore that. They tried to ignore that, and they tried to just ram ahead with, with Ray and the new sequel trilogy and its agendas. And it just didn't work. People weren't going to just let them do that. But I find that it's very rare to have somebody with the strength to consistently stand up and call out the problems in this kind of storytelling when it comes to these franchises that are so beloved. Most people don't have the perseverance to continue to stand up against it when there are these deal-breaking problems. They tend to start trying to make excuses for them. They come over to the camp of, well, it's not that bad. Well, at least they're doing this because they just want to enjoy their franchise again. And they don't, they haven't realized in their mind that enjoying their franchise does not need to be purchasing the latest thing with the logo on it officially from a retailer, you know, whether that's a film or a toy or whatever, it's that, that joiner mentality. I think they want to be, they want to be partaking of the current cultural moment and whatever is 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 uh, being offered whatever the other people are talking about on Twitter or whatever and some of these people will will go strong with the with the standing up against the nonsense storytelling they'll go strong as long as there's a little bit of a community that they can feel a part of you know online Twitter YouTube whatever but as soon as you know the community starts to falter a little bit they, they they're weak they're not really in it for standing up for the storytelling. They just want to, they just want to be able to yeah, just let me enjoy star Wars. Well, you can enjoy star Wars all you like, but no more star Wars is being made. That's not what we're getting from Disney now. And how I'm seeing this happen, how I'm seeing this happen with, with uh, people starting to kind of fall off and not really be so discerning anymore and just kind of going with the flow. And I'm seeing Disney realize that in Disney's, allow they're moving with that flow they're like yeah yeah just come on back come on back we don't need to change anything we did just come on back we'll throw you these bones and everything's fine i'm seeing that happen and this is old hat for us dc fans because we've seen this happen a number of times it, those of us who stood firm 
when the new 52 happened because the new 52 was an enforced change in the comic books for decades upon decades from the, you know, the forties until 2011, these characters in the DC universe had been consistently the same. They'd gone through changes and this crisis happened or that crisis happened. And this, you know, difference to their continuity story or to a tweak, you know, happened here or there, but the characters who they were inside intrinsically values wise, they remain the same. And certainly the big three and the characters that we know and love and the Justice League and so forth. New 52 was an enforced change from the top. It was enforced change. It wasn't anything natural. It wasn't a gradual evolution. You can't even remotely compare it to any changes the characters had gone through before that. It was enforced. These were forces. This was Dan DiDio wanting the DC universe to be darker so he didn't have to feel so inferior to Marvel or any of that nonsense. That was that was what DC became. It was an enforced change. And since then, they've tried not to let that go. They've tried just to let at every turn DC on some level or another has just tried to fold the new 52 in to their history as though it were just an organic change, just like any other. You know, they they started doing the DCU initiative. And people were trying to say, well, you know, they're, they're changing things up. And, hey, now they're trying to do something for everybody. Isn't that good? No, it's not good because nothing changed. Nothing changed that mattered. Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman were still treated in these awful, angry, horrible ways. Superman especially. They basically just made him rocky. I mean, <laughs> he was just an awful, awful, it was an awful treatment of that character. And people were trying to say, come on, come on. You can't just be negative all the time. It's not being negative. It's saying I will not compromise on these deal breaking aspects to either a character or a mythology because you can't have that character or that mythology still affect the same change and the same purpose, the same role in culture if they've violated these deal breaking fundamental aspects to the character. Well, Enough, enough of us stood firm and said we're not going to put up with that nonsense until DC finally gave us Rebirth. They finally gave us Rebirth when things were actually changed. And for a lot of us, it was kind of once bitten, twice shy. It was like, I don't know if I'm going to go just jump right on board. But they proved it, at least for a while. They proved that the change was really back and they were really creating these characters the way they wanted them to be. And it's obviously a, a company doesn't want to admit that they've done wrong. They made a misstep. Obviously. So DC, that was pretty close, though, to making the admission that, hey, we messed up with the new 52. They didn't come right out and say it all the time, but it was it was pretty much on the nose and, and, and on the surface there that they'd done a misstep with these characters. They'd forgotten who they were and what was so iconic and intrinsic about them. And they were rewarded for Rebirth. Pe readers returned in droves. And as I've talked about many times on my channel, Dan DiDio, you know, you've got the, the corporate's ego, but then you've also got the individuals behind the story's ego. And Dan DiDio, that was his baby. New 52 was his baby. Dark, dark DC. Wanted that darkness back. So his ego cropped back up and he started to infuse the darkness back into DC. This is one of the reasons why I don't talk about DC anymore, really, is because I just can't imagine how naive you have to be to think DC is ever going to become something great again. Yes, Dan DiDio is gone now. But all of his lackeys are still there, his trained lackeys and well-trained. You know, he's, you've got your Snyders and your and your people there who are going to to just continue that legacy. The 5G nonsense, that was going to be something new. Well, that's pretty much over now, basically. Uh, it, it'll have to take something. They'll, they'll, they'll have to be even more cleaning of house than just a deal. The deal was glorious. It was great to see him gone. They'll have to be even more cleaning house than that. For, for real change to actually take root there and not just be doubled back on again like it was with the rebirth. So people people don't like to stand firm. They like to just sort of go along with it. Well, that's not so bad. Well, this isn't that. You know, maybe after Tom King's Batman, the next writer, you know, will will be good and we'll get, you know, so and so. I mean, people were telling me this when Tom King was doing his uh famously, you know, infamous ridiculous run on batman and and i told them it doesn't matter because whatever writer they get you know they can bring in paul dini himself to write batman continuity after tom king and he's still going to have to be writing the batman that went through all of these character altering changes unacceptable things that tom king put the character through it doesn't work you've got to change you've got to scrape out scrape out the gunk and start building it anew with a firm foundation now, Star Wars, Disney realized their error after Last Jedi, after Solo bombed and lost money. And they decided they were not going to retcon anything. 
they were too in too deep, whatever. They were just going to bring back Abrams. And the Rise of Skywalker is the most pitiful attempt at damage control. That's really all it is. It's just a pitiful attempt at damage control. And that right there is enough for the weakest of the fans. The weakest of the fans, you know, will will, will roll over right at that point and say, see, see, they tried to fix it. They tried to fix it. It's okay now. They tried to fix it. Nothing's okay. All they did was try to roll everything they did into a firm continuity. This is it. It sticks now. Then Mandalorian came out. When Mandalorian came out, I didn't even watch it at first. Everybody was t- screaming about how wonderful and amazing it was. And, and it was John Favreau and Dave Filoni and not Kay- Kathleen Kennedy and all of this and that. And I came out and said, before I even watched it, I said, it sounds like it's a great show. That's great. You know, you want to enjoy the show, enjoy it. But stop making such a fuss over it and pretending like Star Wars is saved. All this is, is a, is a little series on their streaming service. This this can't save Star Wars because it's not set up to retcon anything. In fact, the best you can hope for is that it doesn't mention any of the things that have happened in continuity because technically it's still set in the sequel trilogy continuity. And people didn't want to hear it. How dare you? You know, the, everybody else on YouTube is celebrating this show and that we just want to join the party and be a bunch of joiners. So how dare you say anything against this or whatever? Well, then we got Clone Wars Season 7. Clone Wars Season 7 is atrociously written as a season. It's just awful. And uh, there's still holdouts. There's still people trying to defend it. I think it it reminds me of the people who still tried to defend the force awakens for a long time. They just couldn't let it go for a long time. They'd invested too much of their ego in the defense of it. And finally, finally they came around and admitted, yeah, I guess, I guess force awakens probably wasn't the greatest step forward for a new trilogy. Anyway, you know, it, it took them a while to do it, but they finally did. And I understand, as I've said, it's hard. It's hard to lose your heroes. It's hard to lose something that you've loved. And clone wars is a very difficult thing because we've had so many great seasons of clone wars and there's been a lot of great things in that, but season seven dropped the ball right after the bad batch arc. The Bad Batch arc was great, but it dropped the ball right after that by focusing on Ahsoka. Now, I've called Ahsoka Mary Sue here many times, and I'll, and I'll explain what I mean by that. And I stand by that, absolutely. Uh, Mary Sue is a character who you give undeserved victories, undeserved accolades to. You make other characters uh, you know, overly concerned with, with that character because she's just your favorite. Um, either she's your favorite or it's politically motivated or whatever. And in Dave Filoni's case, it's, it's, she's definitely his favorite. That's not even up for debate. I mean, he's talked about that many times. We know that he's argued with George Lucas. George Lucas wanted the character to, to die and not go past Order 66, but Dave Filoni fought for her. Well, Dave Filoni's favoritism of that character is now moving in lockstep with Disney's agenda where all the women need to be great. You know, the force is female. They need to be the future of Star Wars. That was Kathleen Kennedy's only direction to J.J. Abrams for the whole Star Wars trilogy. Make the lead character a woman. That's all she cared about. Nothing about story or or honor these characters or bring these arcs back or even remotely wink at the wonderful expanded universe that so many great creators uh, have spent their time in and readers have just loved for so long. Don't even worry about that. So now you've got Dave Filoni's favoritism of Ahsoka moving in tandem lockstep with Disney's agenda now. And we got the end of season seven and people have tried their best. Oh, they've tried so hard to defend this as though it works And every defense I've heard. I've talked about this on uh Sound of Graver channel, for example, they stick at the outline level and they, they make these connections about what the, what season seven was trying to do. And they see that connection. They think, Oh, that's really cool. And they think they've stumbled on some profound defense for the season, but no, The idea of season seven was a good one. The idea of having Ahsoka and Maul have some encounter there was a great one. They are both both cast aside by their mentors. At least Ahsoka will be after the uh, you know his full conversion to Vader and such. And so it was. There were two characters that were interesting to bring together. That's fine. The siege at Mandalore was one little area of the Star Wars universe that we hadn't seen, you know, in terms of what's going, what's going down when order 66 happens in our main characters. So that's fine. You know, even show us some of that. You've got all these reasons for it, but nothing that happened in the end of season seven was earned by the writing at the level of the scene. 
you can have the greatest outline in the world and the greatest idea. And, and maybe you've even got a, a really cool idea for why Ahsoka should, should capture Darth Maul or something like that. That's all outline level. That's planning level. And these are, can be good ideas, but they all hinge on, can you make it work in the writing, which is the actual scene, the actual character development, the actual pacing, the thematic development, making us believe that this character could do X, Y, and Z, or this character couldn't do X, Y, and Z. We don't get any development with Ahsoka. And this is Dave Filoni's tragic flaw in writing. He's unable to show progression. He just snaps his fingers and changes a character automatically. And even when he changes a character automatically, he can't even stick with that change. And I know he didn't write every episode of Clone Wars, but he's an overseer there. You know, he did write many of it. He created the character of Ahsoka and he's overseeing the writing as, as it progressed. He didn't show us Ahsoka develop and grow up. They just snapped his fingers in the middle of whatever season it was. And suddenly she's older. Suddenly she's, you know, uh, looks older physically and, and, and acting a little bit more mature. Yet even then, I've talked about it on the Office Hour stream, she can't she can't hold on to it. She still has that nonsense with the uh, the Citadel, I think, mission where she just decides to go anyway because she wants to go. And, and Master Plo says, oh, yeah, I guess I did tell her to go or whatever. The, the show rewards her for her disobedience, rewards her. She doesn't have any learning moments that the show doesn't just kind of try to rush her over really quickly just to, to keep patting her on the back no matter what. But we didn't see her after she left the Jedi. And that was a powerful arc when she leaves the Jedi. You can tell some things are going on there. That was that was done really well. That was done well. But we didn't see it. We don't know what she's been doing. All all Clone Wars, all Filoni decided it was necessary to give us about what Ahsoka had been up to since leaving the Jedi Order. And that was a long time ago. Is those four little episodes of Roth and Tra Roth, Trace and uh, Rafa, which are awful, awful episodes. They focus more on Trace and Rafa. Tra Ahsoka just kind of has, oh, yeah, you know, Jedi, I guess maybe they did some bad stuff, but maybe I should go back to them. I mean, we don't even get a clear sense of what's going on in her head. It doesn't even really do what it tries to set out to do well. Suddenly she's back uh, now at the Siege of Mandalore, and she's amazing. She's capable of all these great feats, and she's she's so incredibly mature. Suddenly she's, as I've said many times, she's walking around stoically, taking the Order 66 all in and just, you know, doing all the right things and all the blah, 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 and, and able, capable of doing all this kinds of stuff. Ahsoka should not – here's the thing, and I've said this too on Office Hours. Ahsoka is not that integral a part – of Anakin's change into Darth Vader. You can't go back and make her an integral part. If she had left the Jedi Order back when she left it, and that was all he heard from her, that would have been done well, because then you can easily see the memory of her and how he lost a Padawan. That could You could see how that could contribute to his, chain, to his fall to the dark side and to becoming Darth Vader. You could see how that can contribute, but Episode three tells us firmly that it's it's Padme. It's the loss of the, the loss of Padme. It's it's all of these things and all the ways that the Chancellor's manipulating his emotions. That's what causes him to fall into being Darth Vader. You can't bring back Ahsoka at the eleventh hour and try to force her into the story here. It's unearned. That does not work. But people, how dare you? They don't want to hear it. They just want to love their Star Wars and Clone Wars had been something good. So how dare you dare you speak anything against and speak all these truths about season seven and how it how it dropped the ball. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it because Filoni's also behind the Mandalorian. Well, Filoni, and again, you can say this is because of Disney's agenda or Filoni's favoritism of the character or whatever. I think it's basically both. Dave Filoni with the 100% blessing of, of Disney is attempting to remake the star Wars universe with Ahsoka as its central hero. And you can him and haw at that all you want, but look, at what's already happened. Okay. She's already been this great hero of the clone wars, you know, coming back and lauded by all the clones and she defeats Maul, And, you know, he's only free because she let him free and blah, blah, blah. In Rebels, he's already established that she's one of the, you know, the foundations of the resistance there. You know, she's, you know, all this kind of fulcrum stuff nonsense. So she's there. And now guess who's coming to season two of Mandalorian? Ahsoka. Everybody gobbled up Mandalorian season one, refused to 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 stomach anybody saying anything remotely cautious about it because it's great. Nope. Filoni and Favreau, they're going to save us. Star Wars is back. You know, whatever. You know, baby Yoda's so cute. That's all we care about now. 
Well, now in season two, we're going to have Ahsoka. And this is going to be the same Ahsoka that had unearned victories and unearned treatments in the end of season seven, who suddenly retroactively worked into the fabric of the resistance. You know, everything that, that, that Luke Skywalker and all of that was built on. And we know that the sequel trilogy already, I mean, who cares? Who's Luke anyway? He was just a little step in the, in the progression to the great and wonderful, glorious Ray, you know, who, who wasn't even a Skywalker anyway, you know? So I mean, the sequel trilogy is just a mess, but Clone Wars is designed to play into that. They even dropped little symbols, little Easter eggs and hints at Last Jedi and stuff like that nonsense in the in the Siege of Mandalore arc. And I'm even now hearing people say, wow, you know, I didn't even mind the the references to Last Jedi because that, that arc is so great. No, it wasn't. And you see how Disney's doing this. They're dropping these little bones and they're trying pulling people along to get them to, to believe it, to get them to come on. You can do it now. You can do it. 